Okay. Uh, so, I've kind of got three largely unrelated things to go over today. And I'm just going to kind of knock them out and then give you guys a chance to work on your project some. So, I'm going to start by talking about what is this project. Uh, it is our predicting future sales. It is our final project. It is up to 20% of your grade um, because I canceled having three and four as separate projects um, so that we could have a little more time on the last one. Oh, come on, connect already. Be that way. Um, so there is a link to it uh, in this PowerPoint. So what data do you have? You have information on products, product categories, stores that could sell products, and what the daily sales are uh, for a big, long chunk of time. Using this information, your goal is to predict for one specific store, what is the total number of sales going to be for 30 days after the competition ends for every single product on the list. You cannot independently train a model for each because there are 200,000 products. So it's not terribly realistic. So what are you gonna do instead? You're going to look for information on product categories. You're going to have to do some form of or you will likely have to do some kind of clustering. You will probably want to do some feature engineering to get stuff that is useful or interesting out of it. Um, it's possible you'll try some collaborative filtering or something like that, but the complexity of that is beyond the scope of this course, so I'm not requiring that. Um, but those are the kinds of things you're going to want to do. Uh, we chose this project because uh, Dr. Ergl and I both agreed it's a valuable thing to have that has a clear business case uh, for a lot more of you than some of the other projects we were looking at were. And this project does last for about eight months after this class ends. So if you wish to keep going and competing and practicing and learn new things, like maybe take an R course over the summer or uh, go to a boot camp or any of a wide array of different options, you can go ahead and do that while still working on and improving this so you'll have something cool to brag about on a resume. Um, and it is a currently an open competition, so you're competing in real time with other people, which means the discussion boards are going to be a lot more active. Uh, so you can get more help and practice that way as well. From the administrative side, uh, you guys need to have up to three people on your team. They all have to be from this class, even though the other class is doing the same project. They have different start and end dates, and they also have a different uh, grading scheme as for what's required of them. You're doing the same projects, so you can talk to them. There's plenty of insight you can get from each other. Just your team has to be people in this room or that should be in this room. All three team members must be on the Kaggle team. Your Kaggle team must have a name that takes, or that would match this regular expression. So Indicot space hyphen space project three space hyphen space group space at least one digit. Why does it have to be this? Uh, because Dr. Ergel has put together a script that scrapes the scores for every team in either of our sections and sorts them and puts that all together so you can see how well you're doing relative to everyone else. Finally, you need to make a shared project on DataRobot. So in DataRobot, you can share any project you have with other people. Sh create One person on the team should create the project and then share it with the other people on the team. Name it the same thing that your team name is on Kaggle and Canvas, and then add me as well. So share it to me. So that way we can all work on the same thing. We can all reference each other and you can say, 
James, my model isn't working, I want to know why, and I'll be able to look at it and give you feedback a little better than just saying, well, let's try it and find out. And did you think of this? And that sort of thing. So it's there to help you guys as much as it is to help me grip. Here's a timeline of milestones here. I announced this project on Monday. I'm talking about it for realsies now. You need to decide what your teams are today. Um, yeah, I saw some eyes widen. How about I'll say Friday? You have to decide your teams by Friday. Would that be better? Okay, cool. So, team formation we do on Friday then. On Monday the 23rd, so five days from now, you need to make a right track submission. Basically, this is a big complicated project. It's a little different and not a lot like what you have done before in a bunch of different ways. I want you to make a submission by Monday that illustrates that you have made some kind of meaningful, tangible progress and you're not putting it off to the last minute. I've got a list of kinds of, of what I'm expecting of that a little bit later. Wednesday, we're going to spend some time in class working on the project because the big data that I'm presenting is not huge. Um, Monday the 30th, so 12 days from now, you need to submit a help, something for helping others. This helping others content is not quite the same as the novel idea submissions have been before in that I'm not requiring novelty this time. What I'm requiring is that you produce a resource of some variety that is going to help other people. If that means you share a workflow, if that means you make a YouTube video, if that means you answer a bunch of questions in the discussion section on Kaggle, any of those are fine. My goal here is to make sure that other people can use what you have done in order to do better. Um, and then the rest of it, uh, Wednesday the 2nd is our last day of class. It's going to be almost exclusively in classwork. Um, so that's our timeline. Here's our point allocation. Most points from final mo model quality. Then there's a write-up. Your right track submission is worth about half as much as your final model is. And I don't super care how well you do on the right track thing, just that you've done the right steps. Submission diversity, you got to try different things. Helping others, what I just talked about. So for final model quality, I'm going to click this link real. And uh, it looks something like this. It's got a ranking, it has team names, it has when it was submitted, it has a score. The earlier you submit, or the higher your score is, the better you do. If there's a tie, whoever submitted first goes higher. If you only want to look for people in our section, you can type in Indicat up here in the search box. That'll filter out anyone that isn't on my, or isn't in our section. And yeah, that's really the only super important thing you need. But yes, this will be a scoreboard. I think it updates every five minutes, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, anyway, that's our link. I'm going to be doing the same count two things that I did for this, that I'm doing for the project you just finished, the housing prices project with the exception that two-thirds of your points come from the better one, one-third comes from the worse. So you can't just be awesome, and you can't just submit a lot. You need to balance the two to some degree. For the write-up, you're going to have to turn in a little report in you know, a PDF or something. I've got a few friends of mine that work in analytics, I've got a few friends that work in um, sales isn't the right word. Man, uh, strategic product decision. I, I don't even 
Sorry, I'm not that kind of a business person. But decide how much of what products a store stocks, or specifically in automotive parts and repair place. So I've got a few friends that do each. We're all going to get together over some pizza or Chinese food or something. And we're going to read these. And your goal is to write a write-up that tells them something useful and informative based on what you have. You need to include both an explanation of what you did that they can understand, and you need to give insights you found beyond merely what's the best or what's the highest scoring. And those insights need to include considerations for what's manipulable, uh, what is immutable, what's confounding, what needs more research. Um, and these are very much not experts that have taken a course like this. I intentionally picked people on opposite ends of the fence. So there's people who absolutely know their shit about what products to get, and there's people who know way more about the math behind this than I do. Um, and, and, and there's also just a friend of mine that sort of does a little bit of stuff that I just like hang out with. Um, but does have some business background. So they're all going to be looking at it. So you cannot just write to a technical perspective. You cannot just write to a managerial perspective. And you cannot just write to kind of the intersection or the middle or necessarily or someone who's necessarily taken this class. Uh, because they have not taken this class. They haven't taken anything like this class. They, they got their degrees years and years before anything even remotely similar to this class existed. So. You guys are the experts here. You are better trained than them, despite the fact that they're professionals who do this for a living. It has the highest uh, translational validity into the real world that I can come up with. Uh, so your right track submission. So like I said, this is a complicated project. Based on your submission stamp, time stamps for the last couple projects, you don't start it until I make something due. So now there will be something due. Basically, you need at least one submission beyond the sample. You should probably submit the sample too. You need to build a workflow in Alteryx that does whatever joining is necessary, uh, as well as sampling and pre-processing. And you also need to build a model in data robot that you can make target predictions out of, or you can make predictions out of. Uh, this is going to be tricky. And a big part of why it is going to be complicated is that even though we haven't talked about time series analysis and we're not really focusing on it, there are difference in unit of analysis related to time in this project. You're predicting sales over a month. You have sales data on a daily level. That means you're going to have to aggregate something. You're going to have to uh, figure out if there are patterns in the dates that might be useful or meaningful. You'll need to figure out how much a store has to do with this information. Um, it's stuff that would not by default be super easy and right there, like some of the other, well, compared to some of the other projects. So that's why I, you really have to get working on this. Since this is all been on topic, though, is there going to be like a minimum amount of submissions like in the other projects where you have to have at least 10 submissions? Or Not directly. Um, it's more, I mean, I suppose theoretically for the diversity component, you are required to have a minimum of like three because you couldn't possibly do the three different types without three, but you are graded based on number of submissions that produced improvement and in addition to the overall score, your number of submissions that caused improvement is going to be lower if you have a smaller number of submissions. Um, uh, 
I will see how I can go about getting a submission count up there. I'm not on a leaderboard. If it doesn't work, then I'll scrap that because you guys shouldn't have to work against something completely blind. And I'll just find some other way to measure that. Um, but as of this juncture, there is not, strictly speaking, a minimum number. For submission diversity, I need one thing that includes clustering. I need one thing that includes a tool we have not dealt with in this class and one data robot. I guess I didn't include that, but obviously I want one from data robot. Um, so the model you generated using Alteryx R, Python, Weka, or literally anything else. I do not care what it is. The point of it, the point of this requirement within the submission diversity is I want you all to get some practice trying and learning a new tool because you won't necessarily have access to data robot in the future. You've learned a lot of these concepts. You've learned the ideas. You know what a target is. You know what filtering is. You know how, that you have to load data. That you have to transform data. You know all of this stuff on a conceptual level. Using a new tool to do that is something you're going to have to do once you get out there. So that's why literally anything else is fine. Um, because I just want you to know that you can learn and work through something and that you can do it in an environment where you can ask me questions or ask your classmates to help earn points that way. Um, yes? Oh, I, I am 100% fine with you just saying, let's go grab a kernel off of Kaggle and just run that. So long as you can, I mean, sorry, make at least one change to it. Don't make an exact copy of what someone else submitted. Um, but, like, no, just finding someone else's code and being like, huh, this is kind of like something that's useful to me. Click. I'll whack it with a hammer. Click. There we go. That's all I'm looking for. Um, so you can use curls from Kaggle. You can use, uh, within Data Robot, there is a tab labeled Jupyter, I believe, that allows you to run either Python or R on your Data Robot stuff. Uh, these computers have Python and R on them. Uh, built into Alteryx are a whole bunch of predictive models. We've installed that library on here. So these computers have, well, I want to do linear regression. You just drag it down and drop it. Read the help instructions on how to do that. Um, I bring up Weka because it's the oldest and most mature machine learning, open source machine learning library. I don't think it's super as popular these days, but it's been around so long, you're almost guaranteed to run into somebody who knows something about it. Um, and like 10, 15 years of people asking the same questions you might on forums means you're likely to find answers. Um, if you want to go crazy and do something exotic, like uh, use Amazon ML, or no, what are they called? machine learning on AWS, whatever their thing, or uh, Microsoft's Azure uh, machine learning studio, or something like that, go for that too. Really don't care, point is you learn something new without me telling you the stuff along the way. But I'm here to help if you need it. Helping others content? This can tie in great to your do something new, or uh, to your diversity submission from something you learned. If you wanna say, hey, I wanna try using uh, Mars regression in Alteryx, I don't know what that is. I watched some YouTube videos. I read some stuff. I played around with it. I figured it out. Now I'm going to make a few slides. I'm going to make a Kaggle kernel. I'm going to make a three minute YouTube video, something that explains it that other students can use. You can also make this helping others thing. It can be a workflow. It can be something else. As long as others find it helpful. Uh, 
when we have all of these due, I'm going to have everybody kind of rate yes, no, this helped me or not. And that's it. Then I'll just, you know, DF, IDF, and go from there. Are there any questions about the project? Okay. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is the future. So far, we've spent a lot of time in this class talking about things that are kind of cutting edge and near the front and covering how to get you from where you were when you started to that point. Now I want to talk about a few things that might matter more in the future and are a little bit beyond what we can cover here, but may be important before too long. So I'm going to start by talking about some state-of-the-art algorithms, mostly because I'm an algorithm nerd and I think these are cool. So uh, go ahead and click on the demonstration link right here. It's boxcar2d.com if you're not following along. Just go ahead and open that in a browser and then go back to paying attention to me. We'll look at it later. This is a genetic algorithm. It's an idea that has existed since at least the 70s, but parallelization for computing has really enabled it to do more and take off. What you do for this is you have a model. So you know the basic formula for the model, like a regression equation, but you don't know what any of the weights are. So you randomly assign the weights 20 different times or so. So you have 20 different models, each with completely random weights on each parameter you care about. Then you go and calculate, what's the score on this? How good is this model? Is it high accuracy, that sort of thing? Then you find the best algorithms within that set. So things that have the highest performance using their random input. Once you've, uh, what you, how you take the best can be a little wonky. There are a few different options, but uh, generally speaking, it could be something like compare each algorithm to one randomly chosen other algorithm in the, or in the set of models. Or, nah. Compare each model to one other model. The winner of that gets put into the I get to mate category. Now you start breeding your models. What does this mean? Well, it can mean a few different things. It can mean you have two models. You take something in between the two. Maybe it's an average. Maybe it's a randomly chosen point in between. Maybe it's just choosing one of the two, what one of the two parents' values is. It can be any of those. You do that for each different feature. Now you have a bunch of children. However, anyone who's taken the biology course knows that there's one other critical step in evolution, mutation. So in addition to taking some combination of each parent, the child algorithm also gets a little bit of noise added to it. So it adds some randomness that could make it more than either parent or significantly less than the bounds of either parent, or it shifts from being an average to being an average and then a tenth of the point to the right or something like that. And now you have a new crop of algorithms. With these new algorithms, you go and you repeat the step of evaluation. So you go and you test them again. Uh, you test the winning parents plus all of their children. Then you find which of those are best. And you repeat the breed, mutate, uh, breed, mutate, evaluate, breed, mutate, evaluate. You just keep doing this again and again and again. Eventually, because of how evolution works, your algorithm should get pretty good, could get pretty good. What makes this, or some of the things that make genetic algorithms very cool 
are that you don't necessarily have to know what your or how to assess your goal beyond trying it. So in Boxcar 2D, what you've got open in another tab, it's making a whole bunch of carts. The carts have a random number of wheels. They have a random angle for what the wheel is from a point. Each of the little shapes in there has a random angle and a random uh, length of the side opposite that angle. And it uses all of those to say, well, here's a cart. This all together is a boxcar of some sort. How does it evaluate how good each cart is? Well, it runs it through a track. How far it gets is its score. If multiple things make it to the end of a track, well, then whichever one got their fastest wins. So we never have a, oh, two wheels good, four wheels bad situation. And we don't know, oh, does height matter? Does uh, springiness, does length of axis from wheel? We don't know any of that. We don't really know what we're optimizing for beyond we want to get to the end as fast as possible. And the other cool thing about genetic algorithms is now that parallelization has gotten a lot better, it's possible to do this for fairly large generational cohorts. So you can have 20 different uh, variants of the model, or 12 different, 20 different uh, sets of parameters running through the same thing at the same time because, oh, hey, I've got, I don't need to know what any of them are based on the others until that generation is done. So it's not like when I'm running test number four, I need to know what happened in test number three. I can run one, three, four, seven, 20, all at the same time, as long as they all just wait at the end for the ranking step. Um, genetic algorithms have been found, they are wonky and difficult to work with, don't get me wrong, but they have found some very cool things. Uh, they've even succeeded on supposedly impossible tasks before. Uh, the big example that jumps out is uh, they tried to have a computer make a tiny little bot that could receive a wireless signal, but they didn't include uh, transistor. They didn't include one of the components needed from an electronics perspective to actually do it. It was able to find a way around it by saying, oh, did you know that there's electrical interference if you just pump enough energy into one area and then it just tracks that. So it made its own transistor more or less, despite not having the tools to do so. Or at least found a reasonable proxy of it. That's one of the cool things these can do. They can find stuff that you wouldn't think of, but they are very subject to getting tracked in local optimums. Yes, yes they are. It depends on how difficult your evaluation task is. So something like building to see if it can pick up a wireless signal, that requires physically making things based on the design specifications put out by it, and that does take a lot of time. And this Boxcar 2D isn't super fast, although that's because it's running one at a time in Flash on a browser. Um, but it doesn't have to be wor that much worse than other algorithms. Although you're absolutely right, it often is. Uh, you'll probably just want to leave Boxcar 2D running until closer to the end of class um, because it just takes forever to find something good. <laughs> exactly like I said it would. Um, but next up is neural nets. There's a link at the bottom of this slide as well. This is probably the coolest link Kai has shared with me uh, ever. Um, it lets you play around with neural nets and how they work. So what is a neural net? You have some inputs at one end, your features. You have a prediction at the other end. That's your output, what you're trying to figure out. In between are hidden layers. These hidden layers don't represent anything that I as a human can understand, but they represent something that um, will eventually pick up useful information. How does it do that? Every node in one layer connects to every node in the following layer. 
they connect with a weight. The weight is initially randomly assigned. Then as it goes through, using your training data, it's like, here's my inputs. Let's use these random weights. Let's combine them together to get some sort of composite score on this layer. And then let's make a prediction out of it. If that prediction is right, it gives more weight to the path that it went along, or the path that more of that information flowed through. If it gets it wrong, it gives less weight to each of those. So let's pull this up. So here is what I gave you guys to start with. Two input features, x1 and x2. They're trying to predict some uh, two clusters of dots, a blue one and an orange one. Doesn't really matter which is which. So far, I have, or I'm sorry, I guess I have three hidden nodes and I have one prediction. Uh, my one hidden layer with three nodes is here, and it has a weight coming from x1 that's negative 0.2, a weight coming from x2 that's negative 0.028. I'm guessing you guys will have different numbers here. If I'm not mistaken, this is randomized because uh, it doesn't copy that specific information. But it goes and repeats that for all of these. This right here is what happens to the combination step. So when you combine negative 0.2 of this with negative 0.028 of this, you get that. So part of this and part of this is this with significantly more of this bottom. Well, it's even more of the top one. Magnitude's what matters here. Then it has another output step. So weights coming out of here that flow into our output. So I am now going to iterate once. It took predictions from that. It figured out of my data which were right, which were wrong. And same inputs. Now our weights have changed. The weight on this one is more negative than it was before. The weight on this one is also significantly more negative. Uh, the weight up here is also more negative. And then I can just keep going. I let it go through 80 times, and it made better weights, these intermediate models then combine to make a pretty good classifier. Things are in one group over on this side of the line, the other group over here. Now what makes this tool very cool to play around with is it lets you experiment with different numbers of layers, different numbers of nodes in each layer, and different features that go into it. So let's try and make a circle out of x1 squared, x2 squared, x1, x2. I've got three layers. They're going to go to two, four, two neurons. Then I'm going to click Run. And wow, did it converge quickly in terms of blues, orange. Why did it do that? Well, the formula for a circle is x squared plus y squared equals the diameter. So of course, including these two, these two is going to do great. Let's see what happens if I instead try and make it out of these. Now how well can it do? Ah, ooh, not great. It is slowly making some progress as we're going. Just dipping down. So let's try adding some more neurons here. Uh, actually, let's just go 5-5. Five, five. Five, five, five. And sure, let's add their product too. No, that is 100% noise. Let's not add their product.
And as you're going, you can notice that some of these are changing as well as they are getting their feedback up or as they are getting their components updated. Uh, they're just different. It doesn't matter uh, what they actually represent. Is that what you're asking? All right. The point is that they are arbitrary. We're classifying them into two different groups, or we're clustering them into two different groups. We don't know what either group means beyond we were just we just told the algorithm these are what they are. This is what they are. So as we're going, it's still not doing great. So let's try, let's play around with this. Let's have a less noisy one, because noise is problematic. I'm gonna draw, use all the features, but drop down to three layers. Uh, five, four, three. And let's change my activation function from linear to sigmoid. And let's add some L2 regularization. So what's going on over here? Uh, activation functions are what determines how you handle a cutoff. Are you using logistic regression or linear regression or something like that? Regularization is that penalty for more complex models. And did it do it very well early on? No. Is it getting there now? Is it slowly starting to add in new things? Yes. And now after 600 or so, it's starting to resemble a shape, isn't it? We're at 800 and what do we got? We've got two spirals, don't we? We've got an orange spiral and a blue spiral wrapped around each other. So even though I put in essentially garbage, it's anything, I don't know, you figure out the features. And I told it, use five layers, then four layers, then three layers. Make penalties hurt and uh, use a logistic function. So instead of being a hard threshold cutoff, it's more expensive for each little bit of improvement. So the last thing that we had. And it came up with this. That's pretty cool. The fact that I gave it so little information and it still picked up this very complicated model is what makes this cool. And what I like about this tool is you get to play around and try different things to see how much does the activation function matter? How much does regularization matter? That's part of hyperparameter tuning, something we haven't talked about in this class, but something that will be a bit of your day-to-day -day life when you're playing around with these algorithms. And that's how do you change the settings for the algorithm to change your results? Because, I mean, doing this without regularization would be pretty bad. Um, you know, it's just... So it took 600 to get good before. Let's see how long it takes to get good here. Well, at 650, we have literally nothing. Without a regularization penalty, this produced no prediction at all. It was utter garbage. One setting was different, and that's all it took. Oh, hey, I guess it is finally starting to appear. But one setting is all it took to go from 650, gives us a really good answer, to, well, we're at 1,000, and it's still... Still just getting there. It's probably good enough. It took twice as long without a regularization penalty. And it has more errors. So playing around with those little things matters.
So, neural networks themselves can be used to solve and be applied to a lot of different problems. Two of the big ways that they have come up lately have been generative adversarial networks and reinforcement learning. I mean, they're using a lot of other things as well. But I think generative adversarial networks are very cool because they give you something else out of the model that you wouldn't get from others. So the way that uh, GAN works, you start with some source data. You then have a generator that just makes utterly random data. It just says numbers, whatever. Then you have a second algorithm called the discriminator. The discriminator tries to predict what data is from the original data set and what data was created by the generator. Now you have a way of scoring how hard it is for the discriminator to tell them apart. Now you go back to the generator algorithm. And instead of just saying random nonsense, it says, so you had random nonsense before. Here are the outputs that you produced that the discriminator had trouble telling apart. And then you train it to try and th make things more like what the discriminator struggled with. So the discriminator keeps saying, oh, yeah, that's a fake. That's real fake, real fake. Real. You want it to make as many mistakes as possible. That's what the generator does. Then the generator produces a new set of outputs. And the discriminator then says, OK, let's see if I can't tell which of these are real and which of these are fake. And it learns and adapts its model in order to make, get a little better at predicting which are real and which are fake. And you just keep going back and forth with the two of them competing against each other in order to get really convincing fakes from the generator. And your discriminator is really good at telling fakes apart from real ones. Why does this matter? Well, telling fakes apart from real can be reframed as telling data that does belong in this set from data that doesn't. Because the fakes don't belong in the set. It's gotten very good at spotting fakes from all the time it's been practicing against the generator. The cool side effect of this is not only do you have your discriminator that you can use your classifier or regressor or whatever, but you also have another tool right here that makes convincing fake samples of things. So let me just pull up a... So there is where is the one I want? Ah, here we go. Uh, no, that's not the, this one. So here is an algorithm, or here is the output of uh, stack GAN plus plus. I think it's called. It's given text and needs to make a picture out of it. The picture needs to kind of represent what's in the text. So when given uh, oh, come on, I'm cutting off the captions. That's not cool. There's a really perfect one of these around here somewhere that I just cannot. Well, you know what, here, there's another example of it. 
Take man with glasses, subtract man without glasses, add woman without glasses to produce woman with glasses. It can generate these images as a side effect of learning how to tell them apart. It can take the text, this vibrant red bird has a pointed black beak to make this image. These are getting a lot better and are getting very cool. Um, they also let you do some weird artistic nonsense. So you can combine or tell it to make one image in the style of another. So make this image of Donald Trump look like some cauliflower. And then it has a Donald Trump cauliflower. Or, um, let's see, again, where was, oh, there we go. You know what, I, I could just spend all day here, and I'm just not going to do that anymore. Just going to go back to the years. Point is, there's very cool pictures out there if you play around with them. Um, that's not what I meant. I meant to go to the state of the art algorithms. Why are you? Okay. Last algorithm I want to go over reinforcement learning. Uh, this functions off the principle that if you want someone to do what you want, you give them cookies when they do stuff right, and, and you hit them when they do stuff wrong. So you have a, an agent. Uh, self-driving car is a great example that I found here. So you have a self-driving car. You give it the instruction, maximize your reward. It then follows a policy or some set of rules to decide what action it should take. That policy considers a few different things. It considers its current state, so what's going on in the world around me right now? What are the legal actions that I can take? So what is it possible for me to do? What is the, my expected value of my current state? So how much am I getting rewarded for where I am now? And what would my reward be in what I think will happen if I take a certain action? And it has some discounting in there. So it'll say, I want to get more rewards now. Um, rewards in the future are great too, but they're not as important as rewards now. So after it goes and it makes all of the what's my best course of action choices. It then chooses one of those actions. It does this by submitting to the environment, here is the course of action that I'm taking. The environment then responds with two things. The environment will give you, here's what your new state actually is. I know you thought it was going to be this, but this is what happened. And here is how much you are rewarded for doing it. Now, the environment can be something like reality. And physics is what determines the car decides to accelerate. Here's what happens to the person in front of it, the car. Ward can be measured in some sort of internal point scheme where you're heavily penalized for running over civilians. Um, and you are rewarded for obeying traffic lights. And it will go and use something, usually a neural net, to revise its predictions. In the example of a self-driving car, Google self-driving car used a reinforcement learning algorithm that has samples roughly 100 times per second, where it tries to calculate, well, what should I do in this situation? This 
car going to stop? Or is the car from me going to stop? Should I take this exit? How do I stay in the lane when snow is covering it so I don't know? And instead of just like sending the car that doesn't know right from wrong out into the wilderness and saying, well, you ran over, you know, a bunch of nuns, sorry, um, lots of spankings for you. It went and ran it on data from all of those Google Street View cars. Sure, the mapping was interesting, and that's great, but it also means that they have 360 video of tons of driving data. So that's what they got. Um, and that's basically how reinforcement learning works. Give cookies when you do well, spankings when you don't. And reinforcement learning works well because you don't actually have to know what the end states and final goals are. You only have to be able to tell what do you think the future goals are going to be, and you're learning that as you go. And you need to be able to tell how do I follow rules to maximize these goals amortized over time. But enough about algorithms. Let's talk a little bit about some changes that are coming or things that have already started. First, the cloud. In the past, you had to have your own hardware to do everything. And then you had to put your own software on top of it. And if you wanted to do more stuff, you had to buy more hardware. And if it turns out you don't need it anymore, well, too bad. You own the hardware now. The cloud lets you instead pay for what you use by outsourcing stuff. You used to say, you know what? My company is good at designing cars. Someone else is good at managing databases. Let's just pay a person good at managing databases to do that. Then I don't have to worry about stuff that I suck at. Do I have the basic principle that find out what you're good at and do that? That's how you gain the most value. Any time you spent digging around on other stuff, it's time that you could be spending on stuff you're good at, and that's wasteful. How exactly this works is divided into a few different categories. Uh, some of the big ones are infrastructure as a service, where you just rent the hardware. So it would be just like you buy a big empty server, and then they let you you know, SSH into it and connect and give it instructions. It doesn't have an operating system. It doesn't have any programs you want, nothing. You just have, it's like owning a rack or a giant server, but you didn't have to pay for it. You pay monthly instead. Platform as a service is that a suite of programs are pre-installed on the rented hardware. So instead of being a bare bones nothing, it might have a web server on it and a database and Alteryx and, uh, something to make it pretty, and something to generate images, and something to notify you when things go wrong. Software as a service is the next step uh, more abstract. The way that works is you don't actually know or care or can't interface in any way with what hardware is underlying it. You're just given specific programs that you can run remotely. So Data Robot is software as a service. You don't know what they're doing. Well, they tell you on Data Robot, but you don't have to worry about what kind of spot instances. You don't have to worry about which version of R is on here. You're just like, here's my program, here's what it does. Skype works the same way. You're connecting to a remote server that manages all of this stuff. You're just using that program. Or perhaps uh, Office 365 is the one you're probably most familiar with now that I think about it. You have Word Online. You're using it from a browser. You don't know what Microsoft, that Microsoft is using their Azure stuff under the hood. You don't know when they're renting services from Amazon because they're over capacity. You don't know anything like that. You just know you have a word processor that you can use that you're paying some monthly fee for. Um, desktop as a service I'm only bringing up because you guys have actually used it in this class a lot. These computers right here are actually very stupid. They know almost nothing. They aren't powerful enough to do any of the analysis that you guys do. Instead, they create a little virtual machine, often the data center, let's see, <laughs> there-ish, um, like, I don't know, a kilometer, uh, eh, three quarters of a kilometer that way. 
that says, hey, I'm here, and then just sends all of the display information, and it reads all of your mice and sends that over there and just talks back and forth. That's desktop as a service. Anything beyond this is known as XAAS. So these are IAAS, PAAS, SAAS, DAAS. Everything else is just XAAS. And that means anything is a service. Because that's kind of the, trans the direction we're headed. Everything should be outsourced and externalized. Um, so who knows what will be next. Right here, I put some ML as a service, machine learning as a service. I think you guys are familiar with Data Robot, I would hope. But there's plenty of other competitors out there. And they all have different niches and they have different things that they aim for. So um, let's see. Salesforce Einstein only works within the domain of customer resource management. Datoin, Datoin, how that's pronounced, um, bundles people like you guys with their service. So when you buy a rent or provision analysis from them, they also provide you with a handler to help walk you through it, set everything up, monitor, give you information on here's how you select a unit of analysis. Um, and they only have five years training doing this stuff. So conceivably in five years, you're just as good as they are now. So that, that's all it is. It's, they took a class like this and just practiced it for five years and bam, now they're gonna $40 million company out of it? Ain't bad. Um, there's other ones that will focus on different hardware types or different uh, demand, or some of them focus more on text, or you know, all sorts of different things. But point is, there's lots of them out there. This number's always going to grow, and it's always going to change. When I was going through this list, comparing it to last time I presented, I had to remove about seven of these because they have since been bought out by other companies. Um, and then I added a bunch more to make up for it. But this is a heavy churn area. Um, the last little bit about this is self-service analytics. You guys have been playing around in Data Robot. You've been doing cool stuff in there. You've learned some stuff in Alteryx. Over the course of one semester, you guys have gone from never having heard of a lot of these concepts to being good enough to be able to get them to run models and use them. The scary part is that's going to happen to other people too. And they won't be taking a class for it. They'll just see there's a tool that's even easier to use than Data Robot and be like, so uh, I click these buttons and it sort of works. Make it do this complicated thing that I don't understand is complicated. And that's a big area that you guys will be delivering value in the future. Knowing how to use these tools better than other people so that you can give them the dashboards they want, the notifications they want. Um, that you can set up and configure these things for them so they can monitor it themselves. So you make a model, you train it, you set up a prediction API, and then you make a little macro in Excel or something that lets them just automatically run the prediction and get an answer back. That sort of thing that you're helping them the same way you would have 10 years ago, you would have helped somebody set up a database or the like. What are some new technologies that we need to be concerned with? Streaming data. In the past, like even three years ago, most of your data was just going to be a big static database. It's got a bunch of information in it. It doesn't change often. You build your model. You make a new prediction. It goes on. But now you have massive volumes of new information coming in all the time. You could reasonably have to train a new model daily for some applications. That's one of the big challenges that's going to be happening going forward is how do you weigh things expiring because they're too old and no longer relevant? How do you figure out, well, there isn't that much change between when I ran it yesterday and today, so I'm not going to try to run it again. Um, how do I handle the fact that the number of tw er, tweets with the hashtag Benghazi follows this pattern. These sorts of things are all very difficult and new problems that don't have right answers yet. Another interesting thing we've got is IoT. Uh, the Internet of Things is basically just we have computers everywhere 
and they talk to the internet. So I have a light bulb, or at home I have one, two, three, four. I have five light bulbs that all talk to my uh, Amazon Echo. So when I walk in the front door, I say, Alexa, turn on the living room. There's also, you can also go up to a Roomba or a, uh, let's see, a sprinkler system, locks, all sorts of crazy things. There's also a lot of people who have Fitbits and people who have uh, Bluetooth that never comes out of their ear and things like that. These are all devices that have sensors on them that provide new information that we just didn't collect before, but now we have all the time, all over the place. Um, and that means that we have access to more training data and more variety of training data than ever before. We also have access to one other nifty thing. It's called edge computing. So my smart light bulb has more processing power than it actually needs to just be a light bulb. How much extra? Eh, depends whose estimates you ask. But it can run tiny programs on the side. That's how we have botnet attacks, where smart refrigerators and toasters make DDoS attacks. However, you don't have to only use it for evil. If you own, or if you're the company that manages 10 million smart light bulbs, and each has a tiny bit of processing power on it, it's hooked up to a power source all the time that you're not paying for, and it's constantly communicating with the internet anyway, why not have everyone's light bulb calculate some of your data? Why not train your model across a million different little processors? Especially since it very, very rapidly becomes more expensive for the extra electricity to power that computation than it was to get the board in there that was more powerful than you strictly needed. That's what edge computing is. It's very exciting because now that we all have 20 computers on us, let's just get them all doing the same thing. Um, GIS is, uh, it's using location data. It's something that's old. The big changes that make it new and interesting now are people have more devices on them. So now you can start correlating. There's a tile in my laptop bag. There's a tile in my wallet. I have a phone right here that tracks, am I missing my wallet? Among many other things. Using that information. So now you have data on how far is James from his laptop? When was the last time James saw his wallet? Can I use these to make predictions? And it gets even crazier once you add some advances in positioning technology. So GLONASS and Galileo are successors to GPS that provide much higher resolution. Uh -huh. And this combination of multiple sensors and more precise sensors lets you learn all sorts of new things. The last one I want to talk about is quantum computing, only because I think I have to. Every time you talk about the future of anything, you have to bring it up. Um, is quantum computing going to be a thing? I still don't have a good answer for you. Quantum annealing exists. That's what D-Wave does. But that's not really quantum computing. It's some other thing that exploits quantum effects so they can market it as such. Is real quantum computing going to matter and change? Well, we have our first bits of evidence that yes, yes it will. We finally have like non-theoretical versions of it that can entangle up to five qubits. Um, if you can get it to 20 qubits that are entangled, then you've reached the point that that machine is more powerful than any supercomputer could ever conceivably be. Um, just based on processing power. If you can get it to 30 qubits, industrial applications show up because it becomes cheap enough to own. 
if you make it to 100 qubits, then you get to the truly insane models. Like, let's predict what's going to happen given the position of every atom on the planet Earth. That's a kind of complicated model, and I, it's insane to even think about wrapping your head around what that could mean. It could completely revolutionize and change everything, or it might not work. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but the world could be very different in 20 years. Um, I will go over the culture and society bit that I planned to next class, because I want to cover one other thing. Based on the exams, I am decreasing the denominator by five points from your data robot Alteryx portion. Numerator stays the same, denominator goes down. What am I doing with those five points? I'm going to create five drills for you. All five will have the same three kinds of questions on them. I'm just going to change a couple details. It's going to be the first 10 minutes of class on three of these dates, the last 10 minutes on two of them. There's going to be one regex question, one aggregation question, one confusion matrix question. The regex question will give you a few lines. You'll need to write an expression that captures stuff from most of them and does not match the last. You may use regex 101 for this. For aggregation, you'll be given descriptions of one or two tables. You're going to have to choose what fields you need, what to aggregate on, what your aggregate function is, and what needs to be joined if applicable. For the confusion matrix, uh, I'm going to give you a confusion matrix. I'm going to ask you, tell me what number this is if I say false positive. You will need to tell me if I say which of these is precision and then I have four fractions, you'll need to tell me which one's the correct fraction. I also need you to, based on a sentence or two description, select which metric is more important. I'm going over these because they are things that I think you absolutely need to know at the end of this class. And I've got to just keep repeating it until you guys get it. I have made a sample. Uh, one of these. who is sample drill, add item. Uh, you should actually be up here. OK. So the regex question is something like this. Write a regular expression that matches the following. Doesn't match the following. You'll be writing one expression. You'll be using capture groups. You will not be giving me the exact digits of a perfect pattern. Uh, now I look at it, this one actually doesn't have any capture groups. This one is just matches the first two, doesn't match the last one. Don't have to capture anything. Question two. I got two tables, beer and store carries. Here is the beer table description. Here is the store carries description. Then we've got a bunch of drop downs. So you need to join something from this, from the beer table to beer ID from the store carries table. I need to group this by store ID and category ID and none. 
and then I need to return the mean of price charged minus beer cost, and then just nuns for the rest. So it's just a straightforward, we're just going to keep doing these. There's five of them, one per point, and then submit. And I can't actually see a sub oh, I guess I can. Cool. So, boom. And I selected the wrong answer on one of these. But this is what you got. Yes? So is this something we do in class, or should we do it in class? Uh, they will be for 10 minutes in class. Okay. Um, I need to find a way to test that you guys can do these on your own without relying on other resources. I wish I could do that at home, but it's got to be in class. Um, and let's get out of here so that the next session can start.